morning. Can you all hear me? Is that live? That's better. That's great. It's really good to uh, be uh, here with you this Sunday morning. Um, it's been a, a privilege to just be able to come and share God's word with you. Um, I just want to give a big thank you to um, the leadership team here for looking after us. They've been absolutely uh, brilliant. And it's great to see when, when your leaders are really good at hospitality. One of the um, uh, criteria for being an elder is hospitality, and sometimes that's overlooked. And yet hospitality is really, really important as part of the church and in leadership, because it just shows how much people care for each of them. We've been really, really looked after, so a big thank you for taking time to look after us. What I want to speak about this morning is something that uh, I really want to follow on with some of the things that Justine was saying yesterday. But I want to look at it from a different angle and, and just look at how God transforms us. And God today, you know, he is a God who wants to transform people's lives. And I, I just want to give a message out. I really felt quite strongly as I was praying and thinking about what to say this morning. And the first thing that God said to me was this. People need to know today that they are loved. You might have been a Christian for many years, but sometimes, you know, you don't hear enough that you are loved. That Jesus loves you with a depth of love that we will probably never understand. And there's people in this room, and you need to know today that you are loved and that you are valued by God. God really does value you. It's important that we understand just how much God loves us because he gave his son for us because of his love for us. Best illustration that um, I came up with was um, somebody went into a TV shop. I don't know whether you've been into a place like Curry's or another TV shop, and you go in today, and the t- I mean, notice TVs are just getting bigger and bigger. They just seem to grow and grow and grow. And like TV, when I were growing up many years ago, we had three channels. And you used to have to get up off the chair to turn the TV over. Can you remember those days? Anybody old enough? Yeah. Nowadays, these TVs have got numerous channels. Some, I mean, hundreds of channels. And there's these smart TVs. And some of these TVs are more than a TV. You can do all kinds of things on these TVs. But as you go in a TV shop, there's all these different sizes of TVs. They've all got different functions and all got different abilities of what they can do. So if you went in and priced them, you would go in and give them all different prices in accordance of what they can do. If Jesus went into that TV shop and looked at all those TVs of what they can actually do, do you know what Jesus would do? He would give them all exactly the same price. All exactly the same price. The cost of that TV is his death, that he died. Every single person in this room is valued exactly the same in God's eyes. It's not about your ability of what you can do, about your past of what you've done or not done, but it's all about how much that Jesus actually loves you. That we are all valued exactly the same. I am the same value as you in God's eyes that the value that he has put on my life is his death. And we've got to understand that, that we today, that every person in this room, that you are highly valued in God's eyes. And that's my starting point this morning, to understand that you are valued, highly valued in God's eyes. One of the things that I've I've learned as a pastor is that, and over my Christian life, is that the Christian life is not easy. One of the things that I am learning more and more is that I have to understand that who I really am in Christ Jesus. That if I truly understand who I am in Christ Jesus and my decision making and who I am, And the future of my life will be totally different than if I don't truly understand who I am in Christ. If Jesus gave up everything for me, then I need to understand what plan he has for me. 
And I've noticed that um, as, as, as a pastor that when people come into the Christian life, some people seem to grow very quickly in the Christian life and understand who they are in Christ, and yet others seem to just stay where they are. And I began to wonder why that was. And when we get, get saved, we have, uh, we have to decide what our position really is, is in Christ Jesus. Because we don't always understand that our position in Christ, that every single person, if you've given your life to Christ this morning, that your position in Christ is a perfect position. It says that we are seated with him in heavenly places and in him that we are perfect. It's nice to know this morning that in, in, in our spiritual realm that you are perfect in Christ. Here on earth, we still are, seem to be working that out, but in Christ that you are perfect. I often say to Justin, do you know that I'm perfect? If you had a conversation with this morning, she'd probably say, do um, you, you, you really want to know what it's really like? Because I'm still working out and trying to understand my position in Christ is perfect, and yet I am still working that out here on earth. I just want to read from Ephesians 2, just to start. Ephesians 2, verse 4 says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ, and seated us, us with, with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that passage really explains everything to do with our position. That God loved us, we are saved by grace, we are seated with him in heavenly places. That's our perfect place. But here on earth, that God is at work in us for his handiwork, for his purposes to, to perform. Do you know that you were created and that you are saved, not to sit back and enjoy yourself, but you are here to do God's work. We are saved for God to work through us to bring others to Jesus. God has to work in you before he can work through you. It is by grace that he works in us so that he can work through you for his purposes to perform. In Christ I might be perfect, but here right now my thinking almost has to catch up with my position. So when I am saved, my position is perfect, but my thinking is still to do with how I am living now. My thinking has to change and be transformed to catch up with my position. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good and pleasing and perfect will. I am no longer to live to the world's ideals, but I need to change my thinking so I will live according to God's will for my life. So a transformation needs to take place in the way that I think. I need to think from a heavenly perspective rather than a worldly one. In other words, I have to think spiritually rather than physically. I have to live by the spirit rather than in the flesh. Today there is a battle going on and the battle is for your mind. Because it's how you think will enable you in how you behave and how you act and the decisions that you make. 
So there's a battle going on for our minds. In Romans 8, 2, it says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin of death. Romans 8, 5 and 9 says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh desires. But those who live according with the Spirit have their minds on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. This whole passage really explains everything really that I want to say this morning is that as people of God, we have to be people of the Spirit. What this is saying in this passage is that we no longer have to live according to what our flesh, our physical beings are asking for, but we have to live by the Spirit of God. I like to interpret it as this. I want to have heavenly thinking rather than earthly thinking. The problem that we have today is that we are bombarded by what the world says through TV, through social media, through people that we mix with, and that we are bombarded by the way that the world thinks. And what God is saying here through his scripture is that you have to think the way that I think. Later on, it goes on to say, in Philippians 2, I think it is, it says, we have to have the mindset or the mind of Christ. If we are people of God, then we have to think the way that he does, by his spirit. The only way that we can overcome and live according to what God wants is to have a change of our thinking. Our position is safe, it's perfect, but our thinking has to catch up with our position because we are influenced by everything that the world has to offer, but we have to begin to think the way that God thinks so that we can make the right decision and the right choices, which will then determine our behavior in the way that we live. I hope this is making sense. I'm not going too quick. I wonder whether, when you read your Bible, I read my Bible every day. don't know whether you do. But I read my Bible every day. And I might read various scriptures more than once. And what I've noticed is I I can read something 10 times and I'll just read it. And then the 11th time I read it, I get what I call the light bulb moment. That suddenly in the Bible, it's as though God turns on my brain. I can suddenly understand it and I get that light bulb moment of understanding and I had a light bulb moment one day I was reading the word and I was just reading and I was reading Romans 8 and I was just thinking about living by the spirit and what that actually would mean for me personally and I thought well what does that actually mean living by the spirit And then other scriptures started coming to me like, well, God is spirit. So, of course, if God is spirit, and if I'm relating to God, then surely I have to be of the spirit. And then I was thinking about in the Gospel of John, that in the Gospel of John, it's all about the spirit. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he's talking about what it means to be born again he's talking about you no it's not physical being born again it's actually being born again of the spirit so there's something that comes alive in me the spirit of God comes alive in me so that my spirit can relate to God because God is spirit and suddenly I will gain all this revelation of a light bulb moment of understanding of of course 
The only way that I can truly live as a believer is that I have to live by the Spirit. I am born again of the Spirit. God is Spirit. And then the connection together means that I relate to God. And then it all began to make sense and that because of Christ being Spirit, that I live by Christ. Christ is in me and, and I am in him by the Spirit. So it's really important that we understand today that we live by the Spirit. And then I began to think about my worship. So in John 4, 23, 24, it says, Yet a time is coming and has come when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. And I read that and I just thought, how many times have I read that and just skipped up? Well, yeah, we just worship God in spirit and in truth and never really thought about it. So for me to truly worship God and encounter God and, and the kind of worship that God is looking for is not for me just to come physically and just clap on a Sunday. I mean, clapping's fine. I clap. I love clapping. I, I'm, a, I'm a drummer, so anything with a B, I'm quite happy. But what I'm saying is that what God is looking for is for people of God to be worshipping him by your spirit. That's what God is looking for. Another term that, that kind of has, has become um, a revelation to me is that for me to be able to live the Christian life is that I want to please my Father. I want to please God. The driving force in me is not because I am told to do something. I just want to please him. And here it says that what pleases God, so what God is after from me, is that I worship him by my spirit, because that's what he's after. So when we're talking about worship and how we think about worship, it's not what we like. It's what he likes. Worship is not about what I like because I'm not worshipping me. But worship is about what he likes. And what he's after is for me to worship him in spirit and in truth. And there's a, pro, a, a progress where we reach that point that we can worship in spirit and in truth. And I don't want to, because um, it's a totally different message, but very quickly... I'll just do from the notes very, very quickly. In worshiping in spirit and truth. So when we first become Christians and we're not really sure on how to worship. So if you're a new Christian here this morning and you haven't been coming to church very long and you're just wondering, well, how do we get to that point? So, so there's a progress. So you kind of watch, see what everybody else is doing. So they may be clapping. So you kind of watch and you think, okay, this is time to clap. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, or some are like, Oh, they're raising their hands. I'm not sure why we raise hands, but I'll raise my hands. And eventually you begin to understand you're raising hands because he's greater and he's worthy and, and you kind of ease higher and you just want to worship him. So there's a physical aspect to our worship. And we sing, so there's a physical aspect to worship. And that's our kind of first step in worship. But then there's a, an emotional part of our worship. Where, where you progress, uh, in, you, you, you begin to uh, worship God through your emotions. And what I mean by that is, have you ever been in a, uh, a meeting where worship is to so tangible with the presence of God that actually I've been in, a, in, in worship where I've had my hands lifted and I began to weep. Not through sadness, but th through uh, a realization, a sudden realization how real God is. And how much it's done for me. And, it, and, and there are tears of joy, of thankfulness. Sometimes we laugh because of the joy that God brings through our worship. Sometimes we want to kneel and be prostrate and we just want to lay and we just sense how our emotions are, are kind of linked to God in our worship. So there's a, a physical and in an emotional but then there's another step where we have to enter into worship in our spirits. Which is another step. 
And that's where God wants us to be. There's an old hymn, and it says, Lost in wonder, love and praise. And to be honest, I've only reached that point on a, only on a few occasions where I have been in worship and I haven't got a clue what anybody else is doing. And I found myself on my knees, weeping, just lost. And all I can see is Jesus. And I know at that point that my spirit is engaged with his spirit. And the love that you feel, and the peace that you feel, he just comes and he totally takes over your, your, your whole being, that you're totally full of the spirit and the love of God and the peace of God. And you know you've been touched by God because suddenly all fear is gone. All worry is gone. And you've been engaged with the spirit of God. And that's where God wants us to be in our worship, to worship in spirit. But what about this truth bit? To worship, why, why is truth back? Worship in spirit and it, what, what about the truth bit? And at first I didn't understand this. And I really had to think about why is truth there? You know, to do we worship? I get the spirit side now, but what about the truth? There's something about truth. Where, you see, truth never changes. If it's truth, it will always be truth. Truth never alters. It's solid. It's always truth. It can never not become truth. If it's truth, it's truth. So when we come before God, he wants us to come before him in truth. In other words, the best way that I can explain it is that in spirit and in truth is that I come exactly how I am. When I walk in church, I don't put my religious mask on and pretend to be somebody I am not. When I come before God, he wants me as I am. The best way that I can uh, explain it is that truth is always transparent. It's always open. Truth is never hidden. Before God, you cannot hide anything. That when you come before him, it says that everything's laid bare. He sees right through us. He knows everything about us. So when we come to worship, he wants you. He doesn't want the pretense of you. He he doesn't want to copy of you. He made you for who you are. So don't try and be somebody else. He wants you. He wants you, the very heart of who you are, to come and worship him in your spirit and in your truth for who you are. God has made you exactly how you are made because he loves you. He doesn't want you to try and be somebody else. He doesn't want you to be ultra ultra religious. He doesn't want you to pretend to be somebody that you are not. If you're broken this morning, come before him broken. The church is full of broken people. Because we come with our masks. We're not transparent, we're not truthful in that way. If only we would come before him in the state that we are in, if we are truthful before him, when we come before him, he can do something with us. If you are broken this morning, you're trying to worship, it's very difficult. But if you come before him broken and offer yourself to him, he came for you. Jesus said, I've come for the broken. I've come for the broken hearted. And the more I hear today, especially after lockdown, our churches are full of people who are broken. And God is raising up a new sense in church today. I heard a prophetic word last, last week in our church that God is mobilizing his church 
of a people who are going to be worshippers in spirit, who are going to be truth, who are going to be transparent, full of grace, full of love. The reality of who God is, the representation of who Christ is living through them, reaching out to a lost world. It's time that the church arose and became the church in which he wants, not who we think he wants. And today, if you're broken, Jesus came for you. The very heart of who Jesus is, is truth. Jesus said, didn't he? I am. It's interesting they use the word, I am. God, the I am, the way, the truth, and the life. We have to accept Jesus for who he is, that he is the way. When you accept him for he is the way and you follow him, become a follower of him, he shows you the way. He will show you into all truth. And all truth will lead you into life. God showed me just this morning, I was just praying. And I thought, Lord, there's going to be people here this morning and I want to speak into some people's lives. God is speaking into people's lives today. He wants to speak into your life this morning. But what God showed me, I I just sensed that I wanted to to weep over you as Jesus wants to weep over somebody here this morning. Somebody here this morning and you have thought about suicide. You've had thoughts of suicide. And I'm not here this morning to condemn that. I'm here to say that Jesus is here to rescue you this morning. If we knew your story, we would probably say, well, I can understand why you're thinking that way. Good point. Some of the things that people have to go through today is some of the stories that we as pastors are dealing with. We just could not mention in this forum what people are going through, through different types of awful things. And there's somebody here this morning and you are struggling with life because of the pressures of life. And you just don't know which way to turn. And Jesus has heard you cry today. And if that's you, I want you to come and speak to me after the service. And we can help. Because Jesus has come to bring life. And if you don't feel this morning as though you've got life, I want to say that Jesus is here for you today. To bring life. Jesus is truth. He is truth itself. He has come to bring life. In John 10.10 it says this. The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may, t- they may have life and have it to, to the full. You see, there's a battle going on for your mind and for your life. There's a battle today for people's lives. There's the enemy, the Satan, who is after your life. But he's after to kill and to destroy you, to bring lies into your life, What he does, do you know one thing that we need to understand today is this, is that Satan does not know what you are thinking, he's not God. So what you are thinking, Satan cannot read your mind. But what he does do, and what he is an expert at, he whispers into your mind. So he whispers things into your mind that you think, There's an element of truth to that, so you accept it, but it's not true. And there are some things that bring doubt into your mind, even about your faith, that is not true because it's bringing death, it's not bringing life. What Jesus does, he brings life. So 
So what we have to do as believers, and this is really the main point of this message this morning, is this. We have to fill our minds with all the things that are noble, which are good, which are true, which are of Christ and not which are of Satan. So what the world has to offer very much are lies and they are not truth. We have to go to the one who is truth and listen to him. One of the things that what really helped me is I heard this uh, illustration. That in my mind, I think of my mind as a train station. And when a train comes along, it's a thought that enters into my mind. Now, I have a choice whether to entertain that thought and get on that train and, and take it on, or I can let it pass by. The thing is, with my mind, a lot of trains just pass by because there's not much to stop it. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this, the thoughts that come into your mind, you've got control whether or not to accept that thought or let it pass by. And the question is, is when a bad thought comes into your mind, do you dwell on it? Once you dwell on it, you begin to believe it. When you begin to believe it, it will determine what you do in the choices that you make and where you go. In 2 Corinthians 10, it talks about that we are in a battle and the battle that we are in is against, not like of this world, but it's of the principalities and powers. But part of that, it says, and we take captive every thought. And for us as believers, we have to determine the things and the whispers that come into our minds. Do we accept them or do we take them captive? Are these thoughts of God are they life-giving or are they not? And this morning, some of the things that you have heard, you no longer have to listen to them because they are not of God. If you have heard things that you cannot do that, I had thoughts when I was growing up, I had a terrible stutter. I was quite happy, so I played the drums. Ever since I was about seven, I played the drum. So I was quite happy serving God, hidden behind at the back. Just leave me behind my drum kit because I don't have to talk. And then God called me. I said, I cannot. And God said, you can. But the whisper was, you cannot because you cannot speak. You stutter. So I said to God, I cannot. And God said, you can in me, you can. You can. When I look around this room, what you could accomplish if you believed in the God who says that you can. You can. You are a child of God. You are protected by him. You are great in his eyes. You have a destiny and a purpose in Christ Jesus. God will always challenge you greater than what you think you can do. The enemy will always squash you down into what you can do. God will always stretch you so you need faith and you need him to accomplish what he asks for you. But in this room, what potential there is. With you young people, I believe that God is raising up your generation for a move of God that we have never seen before. I've heard prophecy after prophecy that there is going to be a move of God and those leading that are going to be these young people. We have to be able to see through the eyes of faith, through spiritual eyes that God gives us and not what the world says. When I look in this room, I see great potential, but I also see limitation. The limitation are these walls. Because this church is not big enough in the size of these walls. 
for what God wants to do in this place. See with eyes of faith that is not yet, but God gives you what can be. And it's a change of thinking. Can we really believe in that? You can believe in that. There's a transition taking place in this church, but it's a transition that is in preparation for what is God about to do. Do you sense it? Do you feel it? Do you feel as though something's going to burst? Do you sense that God is going to do something mightily among you? Because God wants to move in a way that you have never seen before. Are you prepared for it? Do you want it? Perhaps your mind needs to be changed to begin to think what God is saying and hear what God is saying. If you begin to believe it, your behavior will determine that and you'll begin to make new choices because God wants to move in this place. Are you prepared for it? Are you ready for it? Do you want it? Do you believe what God wants to do in and through you? Can I say that God does not stop working in you because you're getting older? I love Caleb. I'm going to take this mountain. Every person in this room, God wants to use. I'm not bothered who you are. If you're the child of God and you've accepted him, God wants to use you in ways that would blow your mind if you would just open your mind to him and listen to him and allow him to work through you. Stop listening to what the media says and what others have said over your life. Listen to what God is saying over your life because God wants to do something among you and in you. Let's just all stand just for a moment. I'm just going to pray. I just want to pray for you as a church. Heavenly Father, I just pray for every person stood in this room right now. Whether they've been a Christian a week or 40, 50 years. Lord, I just pray, Lord God, that we will begin to really listen and hear what you want to say to us. I pray, Lord God, that we will just open our hearts and minds that we will accept what you are saying to us today. For today is a new day. I pray, Father God, that you will begin to flow through each person in this room by your Spirit. That they will step out in faith when they hear from you and believe in what you are saying over them in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray, Lord God, that from the leadership to the youngest person in this room, Lord God, that they, people will begin to see the expansion that you want to do in this place. To bring glory to your name and to see lives changed and transformed. And I pray, Lord God, that if there's anyone here this morning who feels broken and hurt, that you will just meet with them and bless them and touch them and begin to repair them in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. We have heard the word of the Lord this morning. His vessel was Richard, but it's God who is speaking to us. I would encourage you right now, why don't you write down what God is saying to you? We have many ways that we can write it down. If you've got a phone, write it on your phone. If you've got a journal, write it in your journal. Do not go away from here and then allow just the business of life to catch up with you and you forget the word that God is speaking to you, the seed that is being planted in you right now. Do not let other things snatch it away. Don't let just the soil that is not being cultivated and watered. But We want to see these things take deep root in us as a church because it's from deep roots that fruit grows. We don't focus on the fruit. God makes things grow. God brings things to the harvest. But if we focus on what we can do, just as Pastor Richard has said, then God 
God who is working through us, the miraculous can happen. Things that we couldn't even dare to dream and believe and signs and wonders will come to pass. Through the prayer meeting this morning, we have a prayer meeting that happens at 10 o'clock every morning. We had audacious faith in that room. There was prayers that were filled saying, do you know what? We are going to see transformation take place in Teesside. We are going to see this church not only rise up disciples here, but send out leaders to other churches. We're not only going to see this kid's work thrive, but we are going to see an expansion through schools. We are going to actually be known to see that children's work in this area, every child will get to hear the gospel. These things are not just mere words. These things are not just mere ideas. These are God-given dreams. These are God-given appointments. And for us as a church, this cannot happen just through the leadership team. It can't just happen through your connect group leaders. It can't just happen through the core of the people you see serving around us. It takes a whole army. It takes a whole church to say, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to go. But here's the thing, church. We've got to start with us. Before we try to disciple others, we've got to bring ourselves and know are we connected to the vine that John 15 says are we connected to Jesus are we find ourselves remaining in him feeding on his word because there's a broken world there are people that need to hear that words that we've just heard today and we are going to be the ones that are proclaiming it in our workplace but we've got to have understood that transformation we've got to have received that revelation and understand the power that is walking and moving in us church do we believe it do you believe it well, why don't you grab, there's a connect card in front of you. There is the um, giving envelopes as well. We are going to sing a song called Believe It. And this moment, I want you to, maybe it's taking captive of every thought that you have. Maybe it's declaring that I'm going to live out the purposes that God has for me. Whatever that thing is that you've heard from this word, I want you to believe for it. Maybe it's for some of the things that you've heard mentioned as a church and you go, I want to believe that we can see a connect group in every single postcode around this area. Whatever it is, we have an audacious faith, not because of what we can do, but because of the God that we serve and because it's by his power and by his spirit that we can see these things come. So you ready to proclaim at church?